Greetings and welcome to St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Kinston, North Carolina. Welcome to God's house, where it's good for us to be together in this way, to offer our gifts of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord. My name is Tom Warren, and I have the privilege of serving as the rector here at St. Mary's, and I welcome you this day. Joining us for worship in this service is the Reverend Margaret Pollock, living in New Bern. Uh, she is going to be our guest preacher for this service, and also will be leading the service in preaching at the 8 o'clock service at the chapel in the 930 liturgy uh, in the main church. Uh, so I welcome Margaret as well being with us. If you haven't already, I invite you to access the bulletin for today's liturgy. There's a link to it in the description to this video. And of course, it will help guide you through the service itself. But then also at the end of it, there's a number of announcements pertaining to life and ministry with the St. Mary's family. Well, dear friends, wherever you are and whatever your life is holding, I pray that this liturgy will bring a word of good news to you and to your life this day. I welcome you. And our liturgy will begin in just a minute. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, from whom all good proceeds, grant that by your inspiration, we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding may do them through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman 
whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put immunity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, please join me in reading Psalms 130 as printed in your bulletin. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to note what is done amiss, O Lord, who could stand? For there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. A reading from St. Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raises the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The crowds came together again, so that Jesus and his disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him, and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, 
he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus' mother and brothers are outside asking for him. The crowd is so great that they can't get near him. In fact, the crowd is so dense that Jesus and his followers inside one of the houses can't even eat. The crowd of curious, driven, hurting people amidst whom Jesus does his ministry comes between him and basic sustenance. Not for the first time or the last, Jesus' ministry puts himself in harm's way. A little earlier in Mark's Gospel, Jesus taught and healed on the shore of the Galilean Sea, and the crowd pressed upon him so intensely that they threatened to crush Jesus, and he had to escape to a boat. By now, his fame had traveled beyond the local area, and people came from distant quarters to see him, from Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea, beyond the Jordan, and from about Tyre and Sidon. Now he is at home in Capernaum, a fishing village of about 1,500 on the north shore, north shore of the Sea of Galilee. It is the home of Matthew, the tax collector, and it is not far from Bethsaida, where Simon, Peter, and Andrew, James, and John make their home. Archaeological excavations have revealed that the typical house in Capernaum was small, with mud brick walls, cobblestone floors, and flat roofs, fashioned of straw and mud, and held up by small branches. These houses were clustered in groups around broad courtyards, and each cluster tended to be occupied by many members of extended families. So we must picture a courtyard packed full of people, pressing against the doorway, and even inside the house where Jesus sits. This day, in addition to the crowd, there are scribes, men who are experts in the law. They have traveled up from Jerusalem because the religious authorities there are concerned about what they have heard about Jesus, that he commits blasphemy and has stirred up huge uncontrollable crowds. This destabilizing activity respects a, represents a threat to the tenuous status quo between the occupied Jews and the Roman overseers. Jesus bears watching. This day the scribes accuse Jesus. They claim he is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons, they say, he casts out demons. It happens that the work Jesus performs on this day isn't a matter of giving sight to the blind, healing the halt and lame, closing superating wounds. He is healing invisible illness, the kind that society in those days attributed to demonic possession. Thus, Jesus was engaged in casting out demons. We will get to that in a moment. But first, we must consider those invisible illnesses that brought the faithful to be healed. We have those illnesses today, mood disorders such as depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, debilitating yet invisible illnesses such as diabetes, heart disease, cancer, addiction, alcoholism, immunocompromised conditions, the list goes on. Also, crying out for healing are grief, anger, domestic violence, isolation, loneliness. Why don't people reveal their invisible conditions? Many reasons. Some conditions are stigmatized. Some are humiliating or guilt-provoking. Some are illegal. Some don't fit the image a person wants to convey or must convey within the family or at work an image of self-reliance, competence, professionalism. Some are too hurtful to reveal, even to oneself. 
Some are borne by people who imagine that no one would care. As the poet Paul Christensen writes, My loneliness rises like a winter sun, and there are paths that have frozen under the morning ice. No one is looking for me. I am sealed behind the landscape in a corner of the daylight where nothing is possible. There, soul-like and silent as time, I wait, leaning on the shadow of God, which has built up a pillow of grit and dust in the mind. This is the stranger who lurks in me, whom I reach out to like some desperate child begging to be answered by this prayer. So the crowd on this day comprises a number of people suffering from invisible sicknesses, and the scribes accuse Jesus of casting out these very demons by the strength of Satan. So preposterous is this claim. After all, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the people sense this, that Jesus first responds with three aphorisms. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. We must consider where evil lies in this telling. Ironically, it is not with the accused Jesus, but with the scribes. They are doing the work of Satan by attempting publicly to trap Jesus in satanic activity, a charge that may be punishable by death. Yet, as far as the scribes are concerned, they are doing the work of God by protecting the religious structure of which they are a part. Today's reading from Genesis adds richness to the age-old matter of who sinned and why. The Lord God was walking in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day where he forbade Adam and Eve to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Hearing God's footsteps, Adam and Eve hid themselves because they were naked. We know the litany. Who told you that you were naked, asked the Lord. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? Adam said, The woman, she gave me fruit, and I ate. Eve said, The serpent beguiled me, and I ate. And the poor serpent was cursed for bringing down the entire good and gracious garden that God had made for all creation. Adam and Eve were also cursed and all their offspring and expelled from the garden. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, God, God placed the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the tree to the, the way to the tree of life, which no man nor woman must ever eat or live forever. Now man and woman have knowledge of good and evil. And the scribes at Capernaum are lawyers and have exquisite knowledge of good and evil, yet they get it exactly wrong. They fail to recognize the Son of God and instead conceive that he is Satan's servant. Jesus' aphorisms, a house divided against itself cannot stand, go right by them. At that point, Jesus speaks a parable. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. The strong man here is Satan, and it is Jesus who binds the strong man and destroys Satan's kingdom. This is a stunning declaration of power by this powerful man who is drawing the whole world to him. This powerful man who teaches with authority, not with the dry texts of the scribes. This powerful man who heals all forms of malady, even the invisible ones. Then Jesus concludes with a declaration, truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men in whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. Jesus intends this sentence to be levied against the scribes who are performing the work of the devil by claiming that Jesus is possessed by Satan. This text always gives me chills. Is it actually possible? so to offend the Holy Spirit that no forgiveness is ever, ever available. I believe this text is best read as a truism. For one who turns away from the grace of the Holy Spirit, there is only the cold darkness of alienation. That is true. One could see this as equivalent to the banishment of Adam and Eve from Eden after having sinned irreparably. 
Yet, our faith teaches that for anyone, and here this is available even to the alienated, conversion is always possible. The grace of the Holy Spirit is more powerful than even the most determined blasphemer. At Capernaum, we meet Jesus who binds the strong man and plunders the kingdom of Satan. We meet Jesus who tenderly heals all who come before him, even though the press of bodies is so great he cannot eat and cannot tend to his own needs. We meet Jesus who heals not only invisible sins, but also the invisible ones that are so painful and destructive. We meet our Christ, the Son of God. Thanks be to God. And now let us affirm our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayer for the people. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that, that we all, all may be one. one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That, that your name may be glorified by, by all people. people. We pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Rob, our diocesan bishop, Tom, our rector, and Greg and John, our postulants for holy orders, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they, they may be faithful, faithful ministers of your, of your word, word and sacrament. sacrament. We pray for Joe, our president, Roy, our governor, Don, our mayor, and for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on all who and are named on the parish prayer list on all whose lives and livelihoods have been seriously impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, and on all those who suffer from any grief or trouble, so that they may be delivered from their distress. Rest. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let Your light, light perpetual, perpetual shine, shine upon, upon them. them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Prayers may be lifted aloud or in the silence of our hearts at this time. In our prayer parish cycle of prayer, we pray for the music ministries of this church, especially our organist and choir master, Sharon Veitch, musicians, vocalists, and the music cast group. O oh God, whom saints and angels delight to worship in heaven, be ever present with your servants 
who seek through art and music to perfect the praises offered by your people on earth and grant to them even now glimpses of your beauty and make them worthy at length to behold it unveiled forevermore. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Friends, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. I invite you now to join in an act of spiritual communion whereby we seek with heart and, mo and body to make our full communion with God, beginning with the words that our Lord himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Please pray with me. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. And since we cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. God of life, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection have delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his risen life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Every breath is a gift, and we only have so many moments to gladden the hearts of those who traveled away with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, in the blessing of God Almighty, 
The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.